Pastor, I did I did receive a text late yesterday from Pastor Sam Jacob. He is in the hospital, and he's really sick with, with COVID. So if you guys would keep him in your prayer, he's our, our lead pastor. He's been here with us many times, but uh, lead pastor in India, and he's, he's a sick brother right now, needs our prayers. Lots to sing about today too, guys, right? Try this together with us. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings, yeah you were, yeah you were, now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things, angels and saints cry out, we join them and we sing glory to God. another one we know love this one Lord I lift your name on high how I love to sing your praises so glad you're in my life come on sing I'm so glad you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show
can have a seat this morning. You, you all sound, sound good. great. Don't they? Woo. Way go, girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were here working on them yesterday, and seemed like we got through them kind of fast yesterday. Usually, George says one more time a few times during the Saturday get-together. He was satisfied yesterday. That's, that's a great thing for George. <laughs> We love getting here on Saturday, but there's nothing like being here on Sunday. All together, lifting up our voices, guys. Love these words today. Standing in his love, we can make it through anything, right? What a foundation. Try this together with me. It goes like this. When dark, when darkness arise to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance. I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. Stand in your love Shame no longer has a place to hide I'm not a captive to the lies Not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, just sing the chorus one more time. Lord, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance to stand in your love. Lord, we thank you for the truth of those words today. Thank you for another opportunity to be right here this morning. Lord, to lift up your name, to thank you, Lord, and in those beautiful days that you give us. Sometimes we take them for granted. And Lord, in those difficult days, God, you're still right there. You never leave. You never forsake. So, Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the thanks today. Just prepare our hearts, Lord, for the message we're about to receive this morning. Lord, make us more like you before we leave here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One more, just before Pastor comes this morning. Girls, we're going to echo. Stand. Echoing's good. Echo. Try this with us. This be the name of the Lord. For he is worthy to be praised. This be the name of the Worthy 
us together. Sing Hosanna, Hosanna, oh blessed be the rock, oh blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, Hosanna, oh blessed. time from the top. Blessed be. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. chapter 8 of Romans today, the latter half. It is a tough passage, as have many of these Roman passages, because they are foundational to our faith. They are fundamentals of the gospel. Being heirs with Christ, what in the world does that mean? If you did a little study on uh, the internet, you'd get all kinds of craziness out there. You would, you would get a group that says, we are God's kids, therefore we get all the good stuff and whatever we name and claim and whatever God wants us to do, be this and have that and do this and do that. And that's what they would call being heirs, is that they get the power and they get the control. And there are passages that are difficult. We won't get into it today. That basically says, "Well, we're going to be we're going to be kings and priests before God." No, we are a kingdom of priests before God to worship Him and serve Him, not to rule. Yeah, but we're going to rule over nations. That's actually a lot to do with the here and now, not so much in the future. In that, our faith in Christ is in the sovereign God who causes nations to rise and fall. And if we will stay in tune with him, it does not matter ultimately politically what happens because God is still in control. That was, I think, one of the first wake-up calls for many American Christians. Oh, my goodness, the election didn't turn out the way I thought. God let us down. No, you misunderstood. So to be heirs with Christ is going to include 
your death, because we must die to self to live for Christ. You're ready to die. That's part of the inheritance. <coughs> you need to learn to suffer in this world for your faith because Christ suffered, so that's part of your inheritance. Are you getting the picture yet? Our inheritance in Christ includes hatred of this world for us, suffering in this world because it is lost and under sin. It is relinquishing my rights to him completely. It is dying to self so that I could, that's my inheritance. Well, I thought inheritance was like stuff, okay? Stuff, like don't we get like a pot of gold at the end and like a mansion in heaven? And like in this world, don't we get uh, health and wealth and prosperity and healing? And we're still trying to heal people that are begging in their late age, please stop praying for me, I'm ready to go home, okay? <laughs> now, not that God is going to answer that anyway. When he is done with me, he is done with me, and that will be the end of it, and I will go home. Let's start out with what it means to be an heir in Christ by looking at some verses. Again, I'm not going to read through the whole. It's pretty short, but I've divided it out into passages. Let's put that first slide up, Chris. Here's what it means to be an heir with Christ. First off, we owe him. We are in debt. We are in debt to Christ. Well, wait a second. I thought an inheritance was inheriting wealth and stuff and position and power, and I'm going to own a company, and I'm going to be over this, I'm going to be over that. And all of a sudden, you realize that when you come to Christ, uh, you're a debtor. Now, what does that mean, to be a debtor to Christ? Verses 12 and 13. Let's look at 12, and I've got the bullet first in the verse second. That might be backwards, but that's what we're going to do. First off, we owe Christ the debt of being grateful for his forgiveness of sin and for our salvation from that sin. We owe him that de debt of gratitude always, every day. That's part of our inheritance, and we will owe him that in our inheritance forevermore. And it won't be a burden. It's a joy. It's a privilege to get there. But it's a hard road to get there, ultimately, to our real life in Christ in the life after this. To be grateful. Think about where we are right now as God's people. You know, Beck and I did a FaceTime with Mauricio and the family the other night. <clears throat> he said, how's it going? And in typical Honduran and their faith answer they said you know what God is good taking care of us we got talking a little more and said well how is the environment he says well our churches are shut down we cannot open that's from the government so we stay at home I said well he said here's here's what's crazy all the malls are open all of the streets are open everything is open except for the churches and the schools Anybody not seeing what's going on there? So, well, how is the safety? Because they had moved out of a neighborhood that was a little bit higher risk into a less risky neighborhood. But down there, most places have fences around them, and they're not five-foot fences. They're eight and more wrought iron locks, all of that. He said, well, people are afraid to go out because everybody is so worn out, people are desperate. And so crime is up and violence is up, and people, you don't know what's going to happen if they're going to snap. You just don't know what's going to happen. So everybody pretty much stays put, not because they've been ordered to stay put, but because it's safer, not, not health-wise, safer physically to stay put. So the good part is they're in a bigger house. They have the studio finished. They took us into the studio, and I have pictures. They, uh, they sang for us saying uh, how great um, it's well with my soul and another one too and when they when they talk about being a debtor they're living it they get it they get every day and every hour when they first moved up here Stan I remember 
Mauricio say, you know, we got a lot of friends that think we're just escaping from the country. They're not understanding the call into ministry, and we can't really explain that. He said, but it is pretty dangerous. Uh, last week we had a gunfight up on our roof as they were jumping from roof to roof to roof to roof and shooting each other. He said, it's a, it's a scary place to be, but God still takes care of us. So I, I can't say it enough about that group, and, and we, that's how it's been ever since we've known them. They are grateful for every moment of every day, of every provision, no matter how great or how small, and they say to you, the church family, thank you for supporting us because we've lost all other support. Thank you for, and I said, we will be faithful always unless we just can't be in our own circumstances. But that's just a commitment because we know the value of having you in our life and what God is doing. And he's starting to work on getting where he can do some international work. He can do online stuff and compose and arrange and all of that and, and make a living from that. Elisa, who is a teacher, can't do anything. They're just, they're stuck. Uh, Adrian, they're all still smiling and happy. And here we're over here and we get to go places and we're all grumpy and, you know whiny and all this stuff all the time and and so I guess that's that's where I want to end up today I have to look back at this last year and I really have to stop and think about being grateful for everything because sometimes I just get aggravated I get a little bit testy some of you are going a little bit <laughs> and a little bit grumpy and a little bit whiny and uh, that's you too because I hear you and uh, we give a lot of room for each other. That's why we need to uh, be together. We owe a debt of gratitude, of being grateful for forgiveness, for salvation. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. We don't belong to this world anymore. We don't owe this world anything. And it certainly will not owe us anything other than try to steal everything and, and, and destroy and ultimately kill. So we need to get that part straight. We don't, now you might still owe the bank something. Hopefully you're getting those things down a little bit. We owe another debt. We owe Christ the debt of obedience. And that obedience is so that we might grow in his grace as the flesh dies and the spirit lives. The reason this is so difficult for me today is because I still know how worldly I am. And I know how worldly many others are. And it doesn't mean we're not believers. It means we are fighting this battle with Christ heading the charge. And he is going to win the battle. And we will take a step forward and two back every now and then. We will find great victory followed by great discouragement. And in the end, the Lord says, just obey me. Abide in me. My word abide in you. Let's walk together. I have you in my hand. Don't be afraid. It's okay. And the damage that we have done to our children and to elderly and to so many people by so many synthetic policies that have nothing to do with protecting your life. Instead, they do the exact opposite. Even in that, we still have to be obedient to Christ. And he says, but I'm the one that's allowing this to happen because I have a bigger plan and bigger purposes. So obey me no matter what, and all will be well. For if we live after the flesh, and I'm going to have to define that here in a second a little bit more. Flesh does not mean the physical body. It means the world view that we have as sinners living in a fallen world. And so it affects our thinking and our feelings and our actions and our attitudes. It affects our faith or lack of it. All of that is the flesh. So the flesh is just the world system that is dominated, controlled by sin, and it is attached to every one of us, and we will not be free of it until this physical body dies. But in the meantime, God is doing something. He is lessening the world and increasing our walk with him, even if we're not aware of it. So my last comment, I hope some of you got it in, in our morning Bible study. Beck commented to me the other day, we have, let's see, 
Angelos, Moreland, Carlisle, um, who else from East Texas? Um, um, oh, good grief. He and the wife and the boy, the red-headed boy. There's a red-headed boy somewhere, no matter where you live. I'll think of it in a second. Beck said, you know what? We were there for about nine years. When we left there, there was a lot of question whether it had been even worth it. And Beck said, look at our friends from East Texas. 25 years later, how strong they are in their faith, how they've raised their family and their children, their grandchildren. It's worth it, wasn't it? And it was a battle, though. I'll tell you what, it was a battle. Because we didn't see the results until recently. And yet the results were taking place even every single year. Every single year. I remember Sherry told me one time I gave her a book to read, which is fictional, uh, Piercing the Darkness. It's not good theology, but it's a good story. And we read through that. She said, oh, my God, that's our town. I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. The only thing different is the names. That is exactly us. And we are in a spiritual battle. And we need to know that. And we need to know also that God is faithful. We may lose some of the battles along the way, but the war is already won. We will get scarred up. We will get beat up. We will have ups and downs. We will have all of that. Be obedient to Christ and his word because that way we can grow in his grace. That way the flesh begins to become less of we don't even care about certain things anymore. They're just non-issues. And the things of eternity and the things that matter become more in focus as we live in this world. So we have that debt of gratitude. We have that debt of obedience. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Now this takes us to a time in church history, Linda Chenoweth had commented in their women's study. She said, gosh, we're studying uh, the period of the, uh, it's called the mona monastic movement. And it was the monasteries and the monks and all that. And where the monks would remove themselves from all of society and basically abuse their body to try to lift up the spirit. That's not what this is talking about. It's called aestheticism. I haven't been able to talk at all today. Aestheticism. And it means that basically you don't care about the fleshly desire. So they would go, if it was cold, they would go without shoes. They would go without a coat. They would deliberately get frozen so they could toughen up spiritually. No, all that does is get you sick and kill you. So trying to abuse your physical body is not a spiritual thing at all. It's actually not understanding the problem. It's trying to change the focus through your own efforts. This mortification, this death of the body, it's happening because, remember, we've already studied earlier in Romans, we are, because of the cross and his salvation, we are dead to sin. We are dead to the outcome. We won't be accountable for our sin. It's been paid for on the cross. No condemnation. We need to know that. We are being made dead to this world as the Spirit gives us the mind of Christ in the heart of a servant. And I wish it were a straight upward incline, but it's not. It's just a, a road that's up and down. And so this mortification is by the Spirit. By the Spirit of God, this flesh becomes less and less, and he becomes more and more. Now, let me turn to another illustration that we did learn in East Texas while my brain is there a little bit. Boy, they did a lot of gardening there. I was so proud of my, like, 40 by 60 that I had done with, uh, borrowed the neighbor's tiller and got out there with the rake and the hoe every day. And I remember when, uh, when uh, Terrell called and he said, hey, you want to come and join us? We're going out to the family farm to pick some produce. I said, yeah, okay. Family farm. Acre of watermelon, acre of okra, acre of corn, acre of, acre of, well, I don't have tractors and brush hogs and all that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm just happy I'm growing something.
ultimately to get our perspective changed, God uses the circumstances of life to start allowing our spirit to see things differently. Remember back when we first moved there as a town of a thousand? We were pretty much done with all the chores of the day by about 8.30 in the morning. What do we do now? I had to learn to sit on the porch swing and do nothing. And those of you who know me at all know I don't do that well. I don't sit well. If I were you, I would have already been up and down to the bathroom and then, you know, go outside and wander around. And we were being taught stuff that is to be quiet, be a little more introspective, be a little more reflective, because Americans don't do that well. And a lot of it's because of social media and the speed and the tech world and all of that. We have a hard time being with ourselves in our own head. And we need to be there, and God meets us there so that we can discuss spiritually what's going on. And he will say, you know what? You think you keep failing, and every time you fail, you think, what's the use? And every time you fail, you call yourself all the names you've been calling yourself your whole life. And you wonder if you can ever get out and you wonder if you can ever be free, and I'm telling you, you already are, but it comes incrementally, and some stuff will be removed quickly, and you will know it, and you will thank me for it, and other stuff you will fight the rest of your life, and you will wonder why, and you will question whether you are even saved, but I'm telling you, you're my child, and you're forgiven, and I'm taking you home, and I am causing you to grow in the spirit as this world becomes dimmer and dimmer and less and just don't care about it. I'm a long way from that, but I'm going to get there, I think, because God says we have to die to this world, die to self, die to sin, mortify the body, don't, don't, let, don't let things uh, gain the upper hand where Wealth, instead of being used for stewardship for God, becomes what do I get and what do I buy for me? And we've seen it. We've seen it in family members sitting in about an 8,000-square-foot house, wealthy, by herself, built the house for family. They didn't want it. She moved in just to occupy, was living in the maid's quarters. We went over there one day. I thought, wow, this is a picture. The house was built after Monticello, Jefferson's, okay, with the big dome. Had the big dome, huge house. Walked in, had the big staircase. Beautiful. And nobody cared. Back then, it was probably worth a million and a half. I think she finally pretty much gave it away. It was just sad because it was, to me, it was, we, we loved that aunt. She cared for us. We learned lessons from her. She was very generous but could not receive. And we watched that whole thing unfold, and I thought, wow, this is for our benefit so that we can understand it's not about the stuff. It's not about what you have. It's not about what you own. It's not about what you control. It's not about your decisions. So to mortify the flesh is not to abuse my body to become more spiritual. It's to let God kill my worldview and give me his worldview as his child. It's a process that actually he does through his spirit, and I surrender to do that. Now, there is a piece of this, and I don't want to leave this out. There is a piece of this where I have to comply I have to obey. I have to do the right stuff. So there is some burden on me, but the burden is not for me to succeed and make it happen. The burden for me is to do what I'm supposed to do. And as I begin to understand this process more and more, I, I begin to, over time, realize that my thinking is changing. Some of what we talked about in the morning Bible study, denominationalism, 
denominationalism and all of that. Got to move my mouth. I don't have dentures, wise guy. I have my own crummy teeth, okay? <laughs> and a few parts in there. Yeah, okay. it, it, it happens because that's what God's Spirit does. So, so let me make this statement and then we'll go on. I'll make it as a question. Are you the same believer you were five years ago as you are today? I think everyone in this room would say, I'm not. I'm a different person. That's what's happening. Ten years ago, 15, put whatever. That, that, that's why Beck's comment on the Facebook was so, so, uh, so good to hear. Look at these people in our life from 25 years ago that we left wondering if everything was a failure. We left in a really bad place. We left with a lot of disappointment and anger. And we met other people who were broken and angry and dealing with stuff. And God put us all together and turned it into a healing place for the rest of our life. What a gift. It doesn't matter what age you are either. It's not too late. You're still breathing? Okay, then God can keep healing you. Okay? If you're above ground, if you're below ground, okay, game over. Yeah, you're home. <laughs> Thanks, George. <laughs> so look at the fourth bullet. The death of the flesh is seen outwardly as our lives are lived to be pleasing to God. This is why it's important in the fellowship because there are things that I struggle with in my life that you don't, but I see in your life some of the victories, and I'm encouraged that God is working in all of us. And some of you are a lot more obedient than me and a lot more disciplined than me in certain areas, and I need that. Otherwise, I'd give up. And so while I don't always like what I hear, I do hear what's being said. And I know it's part of the process. I usually get a little bit ticked about it and then go home and sleep. And then all is well. It's magic. Anybody else like that? You're a type A, aggressive type, you know. You know what you are. Number two, instead of being led by the flesh, the worldly nature, the allure of power, of, uh, of uh, wealth, of control. Instead of being led by that, we are led by the Spirit of God who will lead us to the cross over and over and over, over and over. Tom, I said, die to self daily to live for me. I didn't say it's a one-time deal. And so you have a cross, and I have a cross, and the only thing that really is similar is their crosses. Other than that, your cross is yours, mine is mine. I can't carry yours, you can't carry mine. The thing I can do is to try to back off and let God work with you as you struggle with your own struggles and see that ultimately we find encouragement knowing that we're all in the battle and fighting these things. But we don't really find the solutions in that. We find the solutions as we come to the cross and we see other people find victory and we are encouraged by that and uh, that's why the body needs to be together. First bullet, to be led by the Spirit initially is to be led by the gospel to the cross, to repentance, to salvation. Okay, So the initial leading is to lead us to salvation. And in that way, we are, as blind men, oblivious to salvation and sin and God and all that he is doing. We are being led as blind men out of spiritual darkness. And Paul says, then we have passed from death to life, from darkness to light, from being dead to God to being alive to God in Christ. So that's the initial leading, which is being born again. So for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Includes daughters, generic word, okay? As many as are led, and he's not talking about the daily part here, he's talking about being saved, 
okay, in this particular context. As many have come to Christ and heard the gospel and relinquished their life to him and are his children, they are being led by the Spirit of God because now they are his children. They are sons of God. They are his people. But there's, a, there's another twist to that verse, which is the second bullet. As we are being led out of that darkness, it's not just from point A to point B. We're being taught along the way. So let me make a statement. I know you've heard it before. God already knows the outcome for my life in Christ. Point A to point B. Being born again to going home and being with him for eternity, heaven, if we want to use that term. But he's really not much concerned about my destination because he already knows what it is. What is he concerned about? the process of getting there, the journey. That's what he's concerned about. That's what matters. Can you imagine if at birth and very early in your life, you were taught your whole life that, that you're going to die, and so you spend every day of your life for however many years or decades you get worrying about, is this the day I die? No, that's just going to be everybody's going to get there. But in the meantime, what counts? The journey. The journey of life. Not, th th this, is, this, is why, this is why COVID has been so upsetting to me. It is driven under the pretense of caring for life. But the mode of doing that is to scare the pants off of you every day and terrify you. It is not being led, and, and though, and I, a lot of you have had the vaccines, you've had the one or the two, and some of us choose not to, and some of you need to, and some of you ought to, and some of you probably should. That doesn't matter. Now we're being told by one of the lead scientists for the Pfizer one, you know, we might need a third dose. You know what's coming after that, right? You're going to need an annual booster. You're going to need an annual flu shot. You'll need an annual COVID because it's a kind of a flu. It's, I mean, it's a viral. Okay. And we were led to believe that if we all get vaccinated, then we can go back to normal. So you can go to Disney World, but you still have to wash your hands, social distance, and wear a mask. We're being yanked around. That's what's happening here. It's a real problem that under the world is spun in a devious way to control people. And it uses fear as the ongoing uh, narrative. Okay, let me comment on your comment real quick. This is maybe for a few of you. I don't know who you are. Okay, we live in a world of conspiracy theories. And some perhaps I would buy. I remember when we had the one four years ago and Danny and Jacob. Basically, here's how it played out in Farmington. You see all of the mil military stuff going over all the time? That's because they're getting ready to do martial law. And then it, it developed into, and it had a name. I can't remember the name right now. I'd go back and look it up. And it was going to happen July 20-something-something something of whatever year. Okay, So everybody is going out, and they're buying their guns and loading up and doing this and that, getting ready for the takeover. I said, and so Danny was getting very, very concerned, my older daughter. I said, you know what, let me research this just a little bit. And I went back to the roots of that particular conspiracy. I can't think of the guy's name. I can see his face right now. He is the foremost in our world conspiracy theorist, and he, he's made a living off of it. 
And when I found out the source, I called Danny back and I said, so-and-so uh, and so-and-so -and -so is the one who started this whole thing. I've been following him for a long time. Don't worry, it ain't going to happen. Consider the source. Okay, so, so first off, when we get into, we're going to have this put into us, we're going to have that implanted into us, it's going to become this, it's going to become that. All of that is designed to intimidate you. And the more I intimidate you, the more susceptible you are to my control. Now, whether I have the ability to do that is another question. So here's my second statement. People aren't smart enough to pull off these conspiracies. If it happens, it's a sheer accident. Now, are there demonic forces behind this? I have no doubt. Satanic, I have no doubt. But Satan was not smart enough to understand the cross was his undoing. He thought it was his victory. So I need to remember this. I need to remember. Anytime I get start getting sucked into all these conspiracy things, think of the people you know in your life. How many of them are smart enough to pull any of that stuff off? People just aren't that smart. I'm not saying they don't want to maybe pull it off. I'm just saying they don't have the ability to. God's in control of this world, not them. God's in control of this world, not Satan. God's in this world, not, don't forget who we belong to. Or else we, as his people, will be driven by these same things that are getting the world. And we will be afraid and or we will fight back when they're, there's stuff I fight back on that there's really no reason to fight back. If I just leave it alone for a while, it's all going to go away anyway. If I just figure that out. And by the way, I'm a happier person in that I stopped taking certain meds a month ago and I feel much better. And I'm still doing this under doctor supervision. And uh, I turned off news and I am almost news free. I'm about 99% now. And so some of you need to do that. Get off of social media, you'll feel better. Because most of it is made up. The Bible calls it gossip. We call it Twitter. We call it Facebook. We call it a post. No, it's gossip. So we are being taught on this journey out of darkness. We are being taught along the way. You see the difference between the two bullets there? The first one is a blind person simply being led, but nobody explaining anything about the environment or what's going on. The other is the blind person who is being explained to where you are, what's going on, and, and all of those kind of things. And so you're really not blind in that sense. You're, you're very much aware. You can't see it, but you're very much aware. That's us. He's taking away the blindness. He's removing the veil. He's letting us see stuff for what it really is and not what everybody says it is. He's trying to tone down some of his people every now and then. He has a lot of very excited children who, uh, you know, get out on the playground, and pretty soon there's dead bodies behind the slide and head, hid behind the building. And I've been through some of those at the police department. That's another story I'll tell you in private. <clears throat> it is very hard to just be sensible, centered, well-grounded in this crazy world. That's why many of you are in my life. You help keep the crazy level a little lower. So thank you. You may not know who you are, but I know who you are. Third part, adoption. Because this is what ties in with our heirship. How do you get to be an heir? Well, you're part of the, uh, the family, the estate. And I've watched this. Of we've got one, one family in church going through this right now, settling an estate. And... Uh, uh, some of us have had trust made, and I would suggest that you do that. It just makes it easier legally. Some of you may not need that just because of your circumstances, but still worth looking into. What it does is it takes all the legality of relationships, of family and friendships and stuff. It includes intangible stuff. It includes tangible stuff. Within our trust, we have our... Uh, who the trustees are, we have our health uh, desires, our burial desires that we can change any time. All we have to do is if we change our mind, we write it on a piece of paper, I stick it in the safe, and that's the newest copy. It's good. I don't have to keep going back to the lawyer 
uh, everything is up to date. It is a living trust. It's dynamic, okay? So it includes medical and death issues. It includes stuff that we have. Uh, it includes intangibles of our wishes, uh, how we want to be buried, but when I'm dead, I won't care anymore. It doesn't matter. And stuff like that. So ultimately, it's tied to family. So Beck and I are joint heirs of the stuff in our life because of state laws, because of how we have set up things and all of that. What's uh, mine is hers and what's hers is mine. Or if you're cynical, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. But don't go there. It's not where you want to end up. So adoption has to do with relationship. Now here's how the, the Roman law worked this way. If you were adopted as a slave typically from a conquered part of the Roman Empire and a family chose to adopt you, then you had just as much legal and rights to the estate and the inheritance as the blood family. You were exactly the same. Now, what I'm going to get to in a second has been used and abused along the way, so I hope we can clarify a little bit of this particular verse. And, and it has to do with relationship within the adopted scenario. When I came to Christ, I did not come because of my Jewish heritage or lineage or my faith heritage or my cultural heritage or any of those things. I simply came to the cross and I who was a child of the devil am now a child of God because I was separated and we talked about this a few weeks ago, divorced from this world so I could be married to Christ and his relationship and now I have all access to everything that is his because I am an heir. I'm a child. I've been adopted. Now, if you put this back in the context of Romans when it was written, it was written to Roman Jews who were still trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles who were accepting Christ. Because in their view, the Jewish saved people were just a little bit more saved than the Gentile saved people. See what's happening here. He's going he's gonna to level the playing field in the verse we're going to look at in just a second. And so adoption makes us children of God through the new birth, hearing the gospel, believing and trusting that gospel, relinquishing control, repentance, new worldview, being born again by the Spirit, not by strength or might of us, but by His Spirit, and now we have the nature of his children. Okay, that's so important in adoption because it means that I have the mind of Christ, even though I'm still confused most of the time and don't understand exactly what that is. I now have been given the heart of a servant, even though sometimes I don't do a good job of being a servant. He still says, no, I didn't give you a paint job. I didn't give you a new engine. I didn't rebuild anything. I gave you a brand new creature. A brand, you are a brand new creation in Christ. And one of these days, your corrupt body is going to die and it will be raised in incorruption and it will be united with that and you will be eternally who you were always intended to be. And you won't understand it until you get there. So the adopted child had access to everything that the parents owned which was their name, their power, their position, their wealth, their whatever, all of that, okay? Now, here's the verse, and I want to explain this because I've heard it used in so many different ways until I did a little bit more word study on it, and then all of a sudden a new light bulb came on, and I went, okay, I hadn't really thought about that or heard that before. For we have not received the spirit of bondage, to fear again. That's what the world does. That's what religion does. It wants to get you caught up in religion, keeping the commandments, being a good person, beating your flesh, mortifying yourself rather than God's spirit putting you to death. All of that. 
We have not received the spirit of bondage to go back under the slavery to the ceremonial law, to the law of this world, to the standards of this world. That's where a lot of Christians are making mistakes today because they're looking at the world standard and saying it doesn't matter if we're married or not anymore because the world doesn't care. And if I want to marry a woman and I'm a woman, it's okay, it's legal. If I want to marry a man, it's okay, it's legal. And at that point, we have discarded our identity with God who says no to all of those things, and we have accepted back the spirit of bondage. And that's what we dealt with in local ministry here. A person came with an agenda. I didn't think it was an agenda at first until I read some of the texts. So, yeah, there's an agenda there. And we can't allow that to be. You're not, you're not uh, getting rid of the person. You're not condemning them individually. You're simply saying there is a standard, and it has to be dealt with. I've had to do that twice in the last three months, and I hate it, but it had to be done. Some of you were a little part of that encouraging. Thank you for doing that because it was very hard to sleep for those two months. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's where the world wants to take you right now. That's where the current administration wants to make you live every day. Two masks is better than one. Three is better than two. Why not wear the whole box at a time? Every single one of them says, not for viruses on the box. Then what are we doing here? Well, it's to keep people who are just kind of uncontrollable and not so hygienic from coughing and sneezing in your face and spitting at you all the time. That's, that's about it. Okay. I had another thing with Pat the other day. He may have told you. You can ask him. We have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, here's what I've heard this taught for a long, long time. Abba means daddy, and it's a term of endearment, and father is a term of respect. Actually, no. One is Syrian, Syriac. And the other is Hebrew. They both mean the same thing. Here's what he just said. The Jews cry out to Father. The Gentiles cry out to Abba in their language. And the Jews didn't like that because our father's better than your father. Oh, no, they're adopted into the family. Here's what just happened. God is now the one father of the Jews, next one there, Chris, and the Gentiles. Abba for one, father for the other. I think I reversed. Yeah. Same word. Uh, when I'm with my older brother, when I'm with uh, Beck's older sister, I'm not Tom, I'm Tomas. I've always been Tomas. But that's when I'm with them. And then when I go over to, like, uh, where was it, Stan? They couldn't say Tom. Tom, 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 what Tom? And I, go, <laughs> I said, you call me whatever you want, okay? I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That's all that's happening here. It's the same thing. What, what he just did is he said, understand, the Jew and the Gentile at the cross are exactly equal. And they are one body and one people. They are not separate covenants. They are not separate entities anymore. They both have exactly the same access to everything through the cross of Jesus. <clears throat> so it's not a term of endearment as such. It's a term of relationship that might include endearment or it might include honor and respect. Sometimes as a kid growing up, when I said dad or mom, I, I wanted something. And how I said it was me as a child needing help, needing comfort, encouragement, whatever. There were other times that, that I would use those same, those same titles in, in a different way as just respect for their position as my parents. So that's, that's kind of what's going on. So the second bullet there becomes true. 
God's Spirit confirms with our regenerated spirit, the new birth, the new creature in Christ, confirms that we are God's children, whether I call him Abba, whether I call him Father. It doesn't matter. He is the one Father over us all. Confirms that. And remember, we've looked at this before too, and it will show up again as we go through this study. Christ has broken down the wall of division between the Jews and the Gentiles, and that wall was a literal physical wall about four feet high that surrounded the outer court of the Jews, and the Gentiles were on the other side. It had signs posted all over it with Roman guards. If you climb over this wall, we will kill you because we're the Jews, and you're not. But they both came to the same temple to worship the same God. And that's a bit of what we've looked at in other studies of clergy and laity. Okay? That's part of the, there's this division that has been put in there that is, shouldn't be there. So he confirms that we are God's children no matter where we come from. You come to the cross, we're all equal there. You come to the cross, you get complete forgiveness. You come to the cross, you're adopted as his child, and we all have exactly the same access to exactly the same God, to exactly the same presence and Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. See, I don't, I don't base that upon... Well, I answered the questionnaire, do you believe this, believe this, yes, 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 okay, then you belong. No, this is, this is something, this is relational. My spirit within me, through the spirit of God living in me, confirms that I truly belong to him, that I truly am saved, that I truly am his child, and I cannot be cast out, and I cannot be forsaken, and I will I will go home. I cannot lose my salvation because he adopted me and he's stronger than that. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. And here's the kicker to this heirship. Yeah, I would just call it heirship. Because it's being taught out there that this being the heir of Christ is about getting, 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 getting stuff, getting blessed, getting this, staying healthy, staying happy. God, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, God wants me happy. Really? Okay, have a happy day. That's fine. If so be that we suffer with him. Oh, boy, that will take the smile right out off of your face. If you're not suffering for Christ, then you're not understanding what it means to belong to him because Christ was hated by this world. And he said, don't be, don't be excited when the world hates you. It hated me first. It's just natural. They hated me. They hate you. So what did we just inherit there that Paul wrote in that verse? Have you caught this before? We have inherited the privilege, responsibility, and duty to suffer with him. Because if we cannot suffer with him, we cannot be glorified with him. If we cannot die to self, then we cannot live for him and with him. So it ought to take a lot of this stuff off the table that we keep hearing YouTube, you know. It, it's, typically, it's typically media ministries that go this route because they do not have an interactive audience as such. They just have followers, okay? They have followers. And in this, when they get up and say, well, God wants you to be happy and blessed and healthy and wealthy, and you can come and join the Spirit of Prophets. For, for you, we have a special rate. It's only, you know, and they give you some outrageous number that you couldn't possibly afford anyway. And uh, we had some people that were going to move up by where uh, my sister lived. It's north of going out of... Colorado Springs, you take it over to Manitou, you go up and you swing around, and there's a lot of Christian ministries up there. And they will teach you to be a prophet, and they will teach you to heal, and they will teach you to have all these spiritual gifts. And uh, 
for you, you get a reduced rate of, you know, more than you can possibly afford. And, and it's crazy. We had a family who was going to move up there. And I said, well, it's a beautiful place, but it's a little crazy. You need to know it. She said, we've already had them visiting us. They know we're moving in the neighborhood, and they sent out the welcome wagon. And I said, what are they welcoming you with? All the commitment you're going to make, right? They didn't move, thank goodness. Because the pressure is on out there that this is what God means by that. And if you want to be an heir of Christ, which you are, if you have been born again because you've accepted the gospel of the cross and the death, burial, resurrection, uh, congratulations, you just inherited suffering. So get to suffering. <laughs> no, actually, you don't need to do that. It's going to happen anyway, right? We can understand that. When I am suffering, not because of my own dumb stuff I do, okay? That's not it. When I suffer for doing what I'm supposed to do, belonging to Christ, that's a good thing. It marks me as his child. He's not talking about suffering for your own bad decisions, for your own foolishness. Not talking about that at all. He will still, which is, again, I've had that experience in my own life decades ago now, that I got to see a bit of how my heavenly father operates through my earthly father and parents whereby you can do some of the dumbest stuff in the world and still be loved and get out of it somehow because grace and mercy can always overpower forgiveness always gives a new hope a new chance and if we don't do that then we are caught we are trapped and we will live this world trying to mortify our own body, trying to be better people, trying to find happiness, and we're missing the whole point of what Scripture is teaching us. So, we are heirs with Christ. I hope we understand a little bit better today what that means. Heirs to his love, heirs to his grace, heirs to his mercy, heirs to his forgiveness. Heirs to obedience, heirs to forbearance, heirs to, and you just keep on going, keep on making a list. Those are mostly intangibles, but intangibles usually carry more weight than tangible in the long run, right? Let's pray together. Father, help us to understand what it means to be an heir of Christ, and to start the discussion, we have to ask the question, are we your child? And to ask that question, we have to ask, have I heard the gospel and accepted the forgiveness of Christ's death on the cross for me? And then have I had my worldview changed as I have given myself to him and surrendered my life to him and let him take over? It's a tough process. It's not an easy one. It's a confusing one. And yet it's one guided by you. Help us to know that we must suffer and ultimately die in this world so that we could be resurrected, incorruptible in the likeness of Christ, to be with him forevermore. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. A world as it should have been and was from the beginning before sin entered in. Help us to understand this estate that we are going to inherit eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. One more song together, guys, just before we go. When I'm far away from home, the cold wind starts to blow. When I'm empty and alone, I turn to you. Hardness in my heart I can't see the truth Wandering in the dark I turn to you Here in your holy presence Lord, it's all that I can Turn to you, Lord. What else?